Lord and Father, we once again thank you that we have the privilege of coming to the throne of grace. Father, we pray that you will enlighten our minds and our hearts with truths of this time. Help us, Lord, to be fortified on your platform of truth. Help us, Father, to be faithful and that, Lord, we will be part of your work. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to go through the trumpets part two. Um, <clears throat> as, I, as I'm studying the books of Daniel and Revelation, there's many questions that come into my mind, and I hope questions come into your minds as well. And one of the questions that, that came into my mind when I was studying the trumpets was, in, in the trumpets where it's talking about uh, a part of the seas or part of the waters being affected, Yet, in the trumpets, we take a very literal perspective on those seas. Whereas in something like Revelation 13 or in Revelation 17, we then start applying seas as peoples, nations and tongues. And I don't know if that ever came into your mind, if I'm putting ideas into your mind, that why is it we apply that aspect in Revelation 17, but in the trumpets in Revelation 8, we take a very literal perspective on the seas. And the simplest way I think I can answer that for myself, and answer that for you, is, um, and if we've got time, maybe we can, we can go through it. But there's a section um, in the writings of William Miller where he, he outlines, um, basically, rules of prophetic interpretation. And in these rules, um, if we follow these rules, we would have a better, clearer understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation, and it will help us to put, you know, the, the jigsaws in uh, the piece of the jigsaws into into place. And an example, one of the rules he will state is if the context of the text takes a very literal um, position, then you can apply it literally. But if if it seems taking a literal position uh, this does not work with the context of the text, then you take a symbolic um, perspective on, on the text. And I think it might be worthwhile um, at the end maybe doing, just quickly going through those rules of prophetic interpretation. That will help maybe answer some of the questions that, that I've had in, in the past about why we take some things very literal and why we take some things very symbolic. But anyway, part two. Um, we're going to be dealing with the fifth and the sixth trumpets, and this deals with Islam in Bible prophecy. September the 11th, 2001, is a day that the world will not soon forget. The entire world witnessed the horror of people jumping to their deaths and the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City crashing to the ground, all the result of Muslim radicals crashing airplanes into the Twin Towers. As we all know, these radicals were driven by the one teachings of Bin Laden, who, quoting from the Quran, promised them eternal life for doing these terrible acts. As a result of these terrible actions on the part of Muslim terrorists, many are asking, does the Bible have anything to say about the Muslims and terrorists? What is the meaning of these events? Does it mean the world is soon coming to an end? Are these events what the Bible spoke of in Book of Revelation? The truth is that the Bible has something to say about the Muslims and terrorists. And some of what it says has to do with what is happening right now in our world. There are some in our church that are reapplying certain time prophecies, reapplying aspects of the Book of Daniel and Revelation. In particular, they're reapplying the 1260 time period and they're reapplying the little horn power and they're saying rather than these relating to, to Catholicism, it now relates to Islam. Have you heard of this? Okay, there are some, there are some in our church who are presenting this idea. Um, one of them is a, is a retired professor and he's, he's uh, supposing now rather than Catholicism being the Antichrist, it's Islam. And this is not correct. Ellen White tells us clearly that there, were, there was a platform of truth, there's the pillars of the truth, and that there are certain truths that should not be meddled with. And one of those not to be meddled with is the 1260 time period, the, the time prophecies, the little horn power, these are all fixed 
um, in our prophetic understanding and should not be altered. The world trumpets. So we've looked at trumpets 1 to 4, but trumpets 5, 6 and 7 are called world trumpets. In the book of Revelation chapters 8 to 11, we have a message relating to seven trumpets. The last three trumpets are called the world trumpets. In chapter 8 verse 13, And I beheld and heard an angel flying into the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Sounds very familiar to the three angels' messages. The last three trumpets are also called the three woes. Why? Because they were even more terrible than the four before them. And also they were different because a new religion is here introduced into the world, a religion of darkness. The western part of the former Roman Empire has been brought down in the first four trumpets. There is no emperor on the throne in the city of Rome anymore. Instead, the bishop of Rome sits on the throne and rules over both the churches and the government. So now the fifth and the sixth trumpets bring attacks on the eastern part where there is still a Roman emperor ruling. By the end of the sixth trumpet, the eastern Roman empire is destroyed completely also. The, woe, the, world, the word woe or woe here is a cry of sorrow. The evil ways of men bring suffering and misery on themselves and others and only in loving and obeying Jesus is real joy to be found. Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 And the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit and as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit In the first we have the second power coming from the bottomless pit which is um, atheism which sprang through from the revolution in France the uh, French Revolution and then we have the third power coming from the bottomless pit is revived Catholicism which we find in the book of Revelation chapter 17 in the book of Revelation powers inspired of God are represented as coming from above but powers inspired by Satan are represented as coming from beneath from the sea from the earth or from the abyss and here we have some references. The bottomless pit, the meaning of this term may be learned from the Greek which is defined deep, bottomless, profound and may refer to any waste, desolate and uncultivated place. It is applied to the earth in its original state of chaos in Genesis chapter 1. This leader in the fifth trumpet has the key to the abyss, the arsenal of Satan. What does the key represent? It represents power or authority, the ability to unlock, to free or release. What does he release? He releases smoke that darkens the sun and air. The sun of course represents Christ, the light of the world. It also represents truth. And we also found that in Trumpets 1-4 to that the sun was also the leadership of the time, the emperor. And that is also something else that this power did. It darkened the effect of the emperor that was now remaining in the east. It also represents truth. Under this trumpet, a leader is given the key to release from the arsenal of Satan falsehood and error that would darken the light of the gospel, that would obscure Jesus Christ, the light of the world. These points give us a clue as to where to search for the fulfillment of this prediction. Just as the gospel of Jesus is well described as light to the world, so this religion is well described as darkness. Jesus taught us to seek peace and love our enemies. This darkness teaches men that war and killing their enemies is the highest and the best thing they can do for their God. Christianity was never to be forced on people, but Muhammad taught that all should be forced to obey his religion or they should be killed. These people were taught that to die in battle while forcing people to worship Muhammad or Allah as they call their God was the best thing they could ever do. They were told that they then go straight to a wonderful place where they would have all kinds of beautiful women and fancy food to eat forever. So they were happy to make war and didn't mind getting killed fighting for their faith. This smoke made it almost impossible for people taught like this to see the light of Jesus' gospel 
all breathe the pure air of Bible truth. Jesus longs to have these people blinded by the smoke to come to him and be saved. A historian of the Near East, without a thought of this Bible prediction, when he described the rise of Muhammad, used language very similar to that of the fifth trumpet. Writing of the inspirer of the desert tribes of Arabia, he declared, At that juncture, however, like a meteorite from the blue, came into the world a new religion, a religion primarily of power and not of love, a militant fanaticism appealing to the evil which lies in men, and only partly to the good. William S. Davis, A Short History of the Near East. The Arabs had languished in poverty and contempt till Muhammad breathed into those savage hordes the soul of enthusiasm. Edward Gibbon, Decline and Fall. They broke out among the nations of Asia that mighty conflagration whose flames were scattered over the terrified globe by the sons of the desert, guided by their new prophet of unbelief, the philosophy of history. The key. Did Muhammad actually possess a key? It is significant to notice that Perion in his essay on this question says this, The Quran, which is the Muslim Bible, continually speaks of the key of God, which opened to them the gates of the world and of religion. So in the Quran did not God give to his legate Muhammad the power of heaven which is above and fire which is beneath? With the key, did he not give him the title and power of a porter, that he may open to those whom he shall have chosen? Perant, Isaiah, page 189. The key was also a result of the battle and war between Persia and Rome. Persia was defeated, but Rome became strengthless in this, in this uh, winning of the battle. This all culminated in the Battle of Nineveh. Because of this prolonged war, both Rome and Persia became so weak that it allowed a, a, a power vacuum where Muhammad was able then to rise up with his um, followers so that as they started invading, neither Rome or Persia had enough power to stop, stop him. So this allowed Islam to arise with little resistance. So this also acted like a key to allow Muhammad to open up the gates of Arabia. Also notice what happens when the sun goes dark. What do you have left? You have the moon and you have the stars. And this is exactly the symbol we find in Islam the moon and the star. Grasshoppers. Revelation chapter 9 verse 3. And they came out of the smoke locust upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Here we see two more symbols that make us think of the deserts. The locusts that will come out of the deserts at certain times and eat up all the crops. And the scorpion, a nasty poisonous creature like a long-tailed spider with a sting that will strike with the sting in his tail and it would hurt. The Bible employs the locust as a symbol of the Arab. Speaking of the Midianite Arabs, it says this in Judges chapter 6 verse 5. They came as grasshoppers or locusts for multitude. And in Judges chapter 7, 12, Midianites and the Amalekites, Arab tribes, lay along the valley like grasshoppers or locusts for multitude. Notice the statement by Forster concerning the Arabs. In the Bedouin romance of Anta, the locust is introduced as the national emblem of the Ishmaelites, Mohammedism unveiled. Edward Gibbon, quoting Volney, the most judicious of our Syrian travellers, declared, the inhabitants of Syria have remarked that locusts come constantly from the deserts of Saudi Arabia. A famous traveller of last century named Nibur, in his journeyings through Arabia, described the appearance of the swarms of locusts that afflict that particular area of the world. The swarms of these insects darken the air and appear at a distance like clouds of smoke. And here we see some pictures of um, locusts. Look how dark it looks. And here we see an interesting chart. This shows um, where we find um, locusts and where we find Muslims. And you see that in the same areas where here we see um, we have the uh, area of locusts and notice where the Muslim areas are here. We see that where the Muslims have overtaken we find that's where the locusts are from. 
Muhammad was alike instructed to preach and to fight, and the union of these opposite qualities contributed to his success. His voice invited the Arabs to freedom and victory, to arms and repine, to the indulgence of their darling passions in this world and the next. From all sides the roving Arabs were allured to the standard of religion and plunder. The apostles sanctified the license of embracing the female captives as their wives or concubines. The sword, says Muhammad, is the key of heaven and of hell. A drop of blood shed in the cause of God, a night spent in arms is of more avail than two months of fasting or prayer. Whosoever falls in battle, his sins are forgiven. At the day of judgment, his wounds shall be resplendent as vermilion and odiferous as musk, and the loss of his limbs shall be supplied by angels and cherubim. The intrepid souls of the Arabs were fired with enthusiasm. The picture of the invisible world was strongly painted on their imagination, and the death which they had always despised became an object of hope and desire. The Quran inculcates in the most absolute sense the tenets of fate and predestination, the practical result was the inspiration of a magnificent but terrible courage. Arab warriors went into battle convinced that their lifespan was so definitely determined that whether they stayed at home or went to the fight, their fate would surely overtake them. The warrior who dies in battle is sure of paradise. The first companions of Muhammad advanced the battle with a fearless confidence. There is no danger <clears throat> where there is no chance. They were ordained to perish in their beds, or they were safe and invulnerable amidst the darts of the enemy. Edward Gibbons, Decline and Fall. Chapter 9, verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass or the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seed of God in their foreheads. The seal of God, what is the seal of God? Green things here means God's true people who were not attacked by this power but those that had not God's seal referred to apostate Christendom. It says, do not harm the earth, the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 7 verse 3. Abu Bekr was the successor of Muhammad and was now in charge. <clears throat> Gibbons declares this. As soon as their numbers were complete, Abu Bakr descended, ascended the hill, reviewed the men, the horses and the arms, and poured forth a fervent prayer for the success of the undertaking. And what does he say? Remember, said the successor of the prophet, that ye are always in the presence of God. And that's something that we should always remember, isn't it? That we are in the presence of God. On the verge of death, in the assurance of judgment. Sounds like a servant of the Adventists, isn't it? and the hope of paradise avoid injustice and oppression consult with your brethren and study to preserve the love and confidence of your troops when you fight the battles of the lord acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women or children destroy no palm trees and what did the bible say it says disturb not the grass not the trees or those that have the seal of God. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any field of corn. <clears throat> Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. When you make a covenant, stand to it and be as good as your word. As you go on, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries <clears throat> and propose themselves to serve God that way. Now these aren't the kind of monasteries that we find within the Catholic Church. But it says, let them alone, and neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. But what did the Bible say? It says, leave those that have the seal of God. But you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan, who have shaven crowns. Where do we find shaven crowns? Amongst the monks of the Catholic Church. Be sure you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. In the footnote, Gibbon says this, Even in the 7th century, the monks were generally laymen. They wore their hair long and disheveled, and shaved their heads when they were ordained priests. 
The circle of tonsure was sacred and mysterious. It was the crown of thorns, but it was likewise a royal diadem, and every priest was a king. So let's look at the prophecy again. It says, Hurt not the grass, nor the trees, and leave those that had the seal of God in their heads. But we find that there were a class of Christians that were spared, and there was a class of Christians that were killed. And these are the monks that were killed. In the book Truth Triumphant by B.G. Wilkerson, he says, During this time, many of the Christians in the East kept the true Sabbath. That these were Sabbath keepers. And it was these people that had the seal of God. These are the Christians that were spared. In the early centuries of the Christian era, the Church of the East, not the Western or the Latin churches, sometimes called the Assyrian Church, sometimes the Nestorian Church, who were observers of the true Sabbath, very effectively spread throughout Asia and the East, but remained separate from the Church of the West, especially the apostasy. These true Christians became the teachers of the Saracens and were responsible for establishing an educational system in Syria, Mesopotamia, Turkestan, Tibet, China, India, Ceylon and other areas. These Christians kept the true Sabbath. When the Arabian Empire was fully established, it built up Baghdad, its magnificent new capital. The Church of the East removed its spiritual capital from Seleucia to Baghdad, where it remained for approximately the next 500 years. To his Christian subjects, i.e. the true Christians, not the apostate ones whom the Arabs tormented, Muhammad readily granted the security of their persons, the freedom of their trade, the, the property of their goods, and the toleration of their worship. So even, in, even Gibbons recognized that there were a class of Christians that were protected by Muhammad. Chapter 9 verses 5 and 6 And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. This power tormented the Eastern Roman Empire, but did not manage to destroy it completely. So the verse says that they would not kill them refers to a political kill. The tormenting power of these raiders made life a burden for the Eastern Empire, who were getting attacked by them. They would rather have been conquered by them and thus stop the torment. Whatever they tried, the Arabs were unable to conquer Eastern or Western Rome. They failed twice to take Constantinople. When the Arabs first issued from the desert, they must have been surprised at the ease and rapidity of their own success. But when they advanced in the career of victory to the banks of the Indus and the summit of the Pyrenees, they might be equally astonished that any nation could resist their invincible arms, that any boundary should confine the dominion of the successor of the Prophet. The calm historian of the present hour, who strives to follow the rapid course of the Saracens, must study to explain by what means the church and state were saved from this impending, and as it should seem, from this inevitable danger. And here we see the complete history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Every, every student of the word do well to have a copy of this set. Henry Hallam describes the turning back of the Arab hordes as one of the marvels of history. These conquests which astonish the careless and superficial are less perplexing to a calm inquirer than their cessation, the loss of half the Roman Empire than the preservation of the rest. What is the five months? We shall come to that. Revelation chapter 9 verses 7 to 9 And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Here we have a description of what these desert warriors were like. It talks about their battle horses. The Arabian desert horses were amazing animals. They were raised by their owners in the tents right along with the family and were treated with gentleness so that they were very highly trained. At a word or touch from their master, they would run like the wind into battle or flee away across the sand. 
The crowns of gold were the yellow turbans these men wore, and they had long hair, either braided up or loose, and the teeth of lions meant their fierceness in battle. Again it talks about many horses running to battle. The Arab warrior on their swift horses did not march in rows or ranks like Greek or Roman soldiers. They swarmed down into their enemies on their swift horses almost as quickly as if they were flying. And here we see some pictures of these Saracens, these Mahometans. When one examines the locusts of Arabia, he will soon see that they literally look like little horses. In fact, the Bedouins describe them as soldiers' horses. The old Italians called them cavaletta, which means little horses. The locust is used in scripture to denote swarming numbers, and this was a neat symbol of the amazing numbers of the Arabs as they swarmed out of the desert in conquest. The prophet said, make thyself many as locusts. Nahum chapter 3 verse 5 They came as the grasshoppers of locusts for multitude Judges chapter 6 verse 5 The Arab tribes issuing from Arabia with their great speed far ranging and irresistible progress were fittingly symbolized by the swarms of locusts The Arab warriors are likened to horses prepared for battle This also is a true picture of the type of military force that was used by the Arabs in their method of attack Edward Gibbon says this, I shall here observe what I must often repeat, that the charge of the Arabs was not like that of the Greeks and Romans. The effort of a firm and compact infantry, their military force was chiefly formed of cavalry and archers. Breastplate, the warriors wore iron breastplates. Swarm, the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. This correctly describes a locust invasion. When locusts swarm out into the countryside, their sound is similar to that of chariots charging to battle. This aptly describes an Arab army of cavalry rushing into battle for which they were so famous and by which such great terror was brought to the world of the day. Crowns on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. This may refer to their colour. It is interesting to notice that the prophet Ezekiel, in speaking of the Sabian Arabs, says this, The Sabians from the wilderness which put beautiful crowns upon their heads. In Ezekiel chapter 23 verse 42. And here we see pictures of Muslims with what? Turbans. Muhammad says, Make a point of wearing turbans because it is the way of angels. Their faces were as the faces of men. Edward Gibbon in describing the Arab of that day says this, His breast is fortified with the austere virtues of courage, patience and sobriety. The gravity and firmness of the mind is conspicuous in his outward demeanour. His speech is slow, weighty and concise. He is seldom provoked to laughter. His only gesture is that of stroking his beard, the venerable symbol of manhood. They had hair as the hair of women. Authorities record the fact that the Arabs of Muhammad's day literally wore long hair. In the famous Antar poem, written at the time of the Arab invasions, it says, He adjusted himself properly, twirling his whiskers, folded up his long hair under his turban, drawing it from off his shoulders, and his hair flowed down his shoulders, and we will hang him up by his hair. Lion's teeth. Naturalists inform us that the home of the lion is Saudi Arabia. We always think of Africa, don't we? In Arabic literature, the lion is the constant emblem of the valiant warriors. Gibbon says, Eutychus, the patriarch, observes that the Saracens fought with the courage of lions. And they also were very destructible, which is typical of the lion. Chapter 9, verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The rise of Muhammad was in 612 AD, and for a long time after his death, there was no central king over them. Each tribe had its own ruler, <clears throat> but in 1299, Ottoman became king, and what we call the Ot Ottoman Empire was formed. 
We know that the five months began at this time because the prophet says they had a king. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Dr. Josiah Litch. In 1838, Dr. Litch interpreted this prophecy to the Islamic religion, and that the time prophecy related to the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Dr. Litch believed that the Bible taught that one prophetic year, or one prophetic day, equaled one year. In Numbers 14.34, after the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. And Ezekiel 4.6, And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So one biblical year consists of 360 days, which we can derive from the book of Genesis. One biblical month is 30 days. Therefore, one prophetic year equals 360 years. Five-month prophecy equals five times 30 days, is therefore 150 days, therefore is 150 years. So when did the 150 years start? According to Edward Gibbon, Othman first entered the territory of Nicomedia on the 27th of July, 1299. So at this date, he then started and commenced the war on Eastern Rome. And when did the five months finish? In 1449. What happened in 1449? During the whole period of the Ottoman Turks were engaged in perpetual war with the Greek Empire, but yet without conquering it. But in 1449, a change came. In the year 1448, John Pelagius, the Greek emperor, died, but left no children to inherit his throne. And in 1449, Constantine Decosius succeeded to it. He, however, would not venture to ascend the throne without the consent of Amaruth, the Turkish sultan. This was a voluntary surrender of the sovereignty. This row ended in 1449, and the second row starts. So, what are the first world characteristics? Arabic Islam, a power of the bottomless pit. It was sudden and violent in nature. A prolonged war between the East and the West, culminating with the Battle of Nineveh, was the key to and preceded their rise to the power. They were to torment and hurt Eastern pagan Rome and Papal Rome. Story continues, verses 12 to 15. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day, and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of man. Now we see the same dark religious power, but this time coming from the river Euphrates, which referred to the area of the country of Turkey. The four angels referred to the four great sultanates, Baghdad, Damascus, Iconium and Aleppo, of which at that time the Turkish power was composed. The Roman Empire was divided into three parts. This third part related to the Greek Eastern Empire, and the capital was Constantinople. So the second time prophecy, this is what Josiah Litch was studying. Notice this time period, an hour, a day, and a month, and a year. What does that all add up to when you follow it through? It comes to a total of 391 years and 15 days. So when did the time prophecy start? At the end of the fifth trumpet. 27th of July, 1449. Josiah Litch predicted that the fall of the Ottoman Empire would happen sometime in August, 1840. Weeks before the date, he then narrowed it down to the 11th of August, 1840. And the prophecy was fulfilled. You add 27th of July, 1449. You add 391 years and 15 days. You come to the 11th of August, 1840. What happened in 1840? On the 11th of August 1840, on board a ship, 
The Turkish leader has signed the paper that took away the independence and the power of the Turkish Sultan forever. Where then was Turkish supremacy on August 11th, 1840? It was gone. Who now held the power? The four great powers of Europe. Up until that time, they had continued to attack that eastern part of the Roman Empire until the last remains of it were gone and the modern nations ruled. This amazing prophecy was pointed out and written up in the newspapers before 11th of August 1840. And when it really happened on time, many people believed that God's word was true. It's reported that over a thousand infidels gave their lives to Christ. And what really happened in 1840? It confirmed that the day for year principle held. Therefore, when William Miller was preaching that the end of the world would take place at the end of 2,300 years, they believed it. What else happened in 1840? We find the chapter of Revelation 10 um, is between Revelation chapter 9 and 11. And this portrays the history of the Advent movement between 1840 and 1844. And a mighty angel came down. We find that this history took place at 1840. So this mighty angel came down with power. What gave power to the people? That the day for year principle was true. This is what took place. There's war with Egypt. For several years the Sultan had been embroiled in war with Muhammad Ali, Pasha of Egypt. In 1838 there was a threatening of war between the Sultan and his Egyptian vassal. Muhammad Ali Pasha, in a note addressing to the foreign consuls, declared that in future he would pay no tribute to the Porte and that he considered himself independent sovereign of Egypt, Arabia and Syria. The Sultan, naturally incensed at this declaration, would have immediately commenced hostilities had he not been restrained by the influence of the foreign ambassadors and persuaded to delay. This war, however, was finally averted by the announcement of Muhammad that he was ready to pay $1 million. In 1839, hostilities again commenced and were prosecuted until in a general battle between the armies of the Sultan and Muhammad, the Sultan's army was entirely cut up and destroyed and his fleet taken by Muhammad and carried into Egypt. So completely had the Sultan's fleet been reduced that when hostilities commenced in August, he had only two first rates and three frigates, as the sad remains of the once powerful Turkish fleet. This fleet Muhammad positively refused to give up and return to the Sultan and declared if the powers attempted to take it from him, he would burn it. In this posture, affairs stood when in 1840 England, Russia, Austria and Prussia interposed and determined on the settlement of the difficulty for it is evident if let alone Muhammad would soon become master of the Sultan's throne. The letter of ultimatum was handed to the Pasha on the exact date, 11th of August 1840, which signified the voluntary end of the Ottoman Empire into the hands and control of the four nations. The Sultan became like a puppet just in the same way as the Greek Empire in 1449. So what happened in, in 1449? We had um, four angels let loose and we had the Empress uh, surrendering his power and what took place in 1840, we have the four powers, the four angels, closing and restraining uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And what did they do? They surrendered their power to these four powers or these four angels. Verse 16. And the number of the army of horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the numbers of them. And the Greek and Hebrew is translated actually as myriads. And here we have some references in, in the Bible that thousands is, is represented as myriads. It was the Turkish method of numbering. They numbered it by tomans. A toman is 10,000 people, or the number 10,000, or myriad. Gibbon himself uses this very term when he describes the Turks. Alluding to Timur the Lame, the leader of the Tartars or Eastern Turks from Mongolia, he says this. The sea, the Bosphorus, rolled between the two continents of Europe and Asia, and the lord of so many tomans or myriads of horse was not master of a single valley. And of the Turkish invasion of Asia Minor, he says, the myriads of Turkish horse overspread the frontier of 600 miles from, Tart from Taurus to Azarun. 
verses 17 to 18 and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths the word jacinth is jacinth in the Greek and denotes the color blue Thus, when it speaks of fire and jacinth and brimstone, it means red, blue and yellow. Fire is red, jacinth is blue and brimstone or sulphur is yellow. Red, blue and yellow. These were the colours of the uniforms of the Turkish army. And Du Bruz, an English scholar writing at the time, says this. From their first appearance, the Ottomans have affected to wear warlike apparel of scarlet, blue and yellow. A descriptive trait the more marked from its contrast to the military appearance of Greeks, Franks or Saracens who were contemporary of the time. At this time gunpowder and guns were used for the first time against the people in Eastern Europe. When the pistols were held close to the horses as they rode to the attack it looked like fire and brimstone came from the mouths of the horses. This is also the time that knights in armour weren't much use anymore as the armour could not stop the bullets. Tails in verse 19 for their power is in their mouth and in their tails for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with many of them and with them they do hurt the Turks peculiar ensign the standard that they used to represent authority was a horse's tail from prime visor to the governors of provinces the horse's tail was the badge of authority as Eliot says, the ensign of one, two or three horse tails that marks distinctively the dignity and power of the Turkish Pasha. And here we see a standard with three horse tails. What else does tails a mouthpiece mean? In the book of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 4, we have reference to tails meaning the enemies to God's people. And at this time under the sixth trumpet, there were many Christians persecuted. We also have tales in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15 representative of false prophet and we found that in Islam there was a false prophet Muhammad and, and all the Imams and Mullahs they are also false prophets and the mouthpiece Aaron was Moses was Moses mouthpiece so we have false prophets working through Islam the mouthpiece of Satan Protestantism it is also fascinating to learn that the Ottoman Turks in particular were a great aid to the Protestant Reformation. When Turks were invading Europe, King Charles V of Spain was Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. This was the Roman Catholic political empire of the Middle Ages. Protestantism had risen in 1517 and thousands of people had left Mother Church to become Protestants. Charles V, being a devout Roman Catholic, was fervently persuaded by his church not only to oppose the Protestant faith, but to destroy it. But whenever he advanced to attack the Protestants, so often tidings would come that the Turks were on the attack and Charles would be forced to turn away from the Protestants and march against the Turks. History is very clear that had it not been for the Turks, Protestantism would never have survived. In the 16th and 17th centuries, support and encouragement for Protestants and Calvinists were one of the fundamental principles of the Ottoman policy. And there would have been no Protestantism had there been no Turk. Or God would have used another means. And here we find Constantinople that under the sixth trumpet, Constantinople was eventually destroyed. On April 6, 1453, Muhammad II assembled 258,000 men to commence the attack. Using cannons, the city was taken 29th of May, 1453. And here we see Constantinople where it is, and today it's modern Turkey. And it was eventually destroyed. Lessons learned. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of silver and gold and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor their fornication, nor of their thefts. And under the seven trumpet brethren, 
these men will be destroyed. Here we see lessons that God wanted people to learn. The Roman church was worshipping images and they worshipped dead people as saints. When you worship the dead, you really worship devils. People also make idols of gold and silver, money, always trying to get as much as they can away from other people. The murders, thefts and sorcery are all part of the false system of worship and the persecution of all who differed with them. The fornication is when the church uses the government power to force her religion on others. Sadly, the Roman church did not learn its lessons from these woes. If we have hard times or trouble comes into our lives, it is good to see and learn into some lessons that we should learn. Second world characteristics, it was Turkish Islam, a power from the bottomless pit. It was sudden and violent in nature with an emphasis on the use of gunpowder. They were to slay or kill the Eastern pagan Rome. And during this time, paper Rome was also slain by atheistic France, which was also another power that came from the bottomless pit. And the deadly wound was inflicted. And the second row ended on 22nd of October, 1844. How do we know that the, second, that the second row ended in October 1844, when you might be thinking it was 11th of August 1840? Well, when you look at the um, sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, okay, we find Revelation chapter 10 and Revelation chapter 11. And what takes place in chapter 10 is the history of the Advent movement between 1840 and 1844. We also find that in chapter 11, we have the um, deadly wound in 1798. And also before um, Ellen White came on the scene as a prophet, there were two prophets before Ellen White. There was William Foy and Hazen Foss. William Foy, in 1842, he had three visions. The second of his visions, the first and second visions, he documented and published. And in this second vision, he relates that an angel, he heard the angel saying that the sixth trumpet was still sounding. Okay, so in 1842, the sixth trumpet was still sounding. Okay, and then we find that in Revelation chapter 11, the... Uh, where we find the seventh trumpet, we see a scene where the sanctuary in heaven is opened up, the temple in heaven is opened up. And when did the sanctuary in heaven open up? In October 22nd, 1844. Therefore, that ends the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet begins on, on 22nd of October, 1844. The third row, what's the third row, brethren, under the seventh trumpet? Could the third row also be radical Islam. Summarizing, God is in control. He's already outlined history before it even happened. One prophetic day is equivalent to one literal year. It's established under the prophecy. The fifth and sixth trumpets related to the Islamic movement. God used Islam to preserve the Protestant Reformation. Four angels loosed in 1449 and four angels of four powers bind Islam in 1840. In 1449, voluntary surrender of Eastern Rome and in 1840, voluntary surrender of Turkey. And we are now in the seventh trumpet. What does that mean for us? Ellen White also tells us in the book Great Controversy that these uh, prophecies under the fifth and sixth trumpet was a remarkable fulfillment of Bible prophecy. That locks in for us Adventists that the fifth and sixth trumpets are in the past. It's locked. If the fifth and sixth trumpets are uh, relating to Islam and the prophecies, the time prophecies are fixed, then we know that trumpets one to four, the historical events, are also fixed and correct. Which means that we cannot reapply these uh, trumpets to the future. Let's summarize again the first row. It was Islam, Arab, Arabian. It wars against the armies of Rome. It hurts the armies of Rome. Strikes suddenly and unexpectedly. It rises after prolonged warfare between two powers. Occurs during a sealing time. A blessing and a curse. Inspired and directed by religious leaders. The second row, Islam, Turkish Islam this time. 
wars against the armies of Rome. It kills the armies of Rome. It strikes suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. It occurs during a second sealing time. A blessing and a curse inspired and directed by religious leaders. The third row brethren, Islam is worldwide. Becomes strong during a prolonged war between the war between USA and Russia. Both powers are, are concentrating on each other and what took place at the fall of communism in 1989 we all of a sudden have a, have a increase in radical Islamic terrorism it wars against the armies of Rome who are the armies of Rome today? who helped the papacy to bring down the fall of communism? it was the USA the USA today and its allies are the armies of Rome it hurts and kills the armies of Rome strikes suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives what took place in 2001 it occurs during a sealing time are we not going to be sealed during this time where God is preparing his people for the close of probation they are a blessing and a curse how can there be a blessing and a curse because the whole world is preoccupied with Islam rather than Seventh Day Adventists the Catholic Church has better things to deal with, the, deal with us because they've got to deal with the Islamics first then once they've dealt with Islam then they can come for us and they are inspired and directed by religious leaders bottomless pit Islam collapsed in 1840 that was a power from the bottomless pit the second power coming from the bottomless pit was the collapse of Russian communism in 1989 so the first and second powers will be involved in the last days because we also have a revived power from the bottomless pit and we know that at the end of the world that too will this be destroyed radical Islam it has been predicted that there will be a World War 3 involving Islam Islam's involvement in the third world will be a force that will unite the world powers together and what do we find today post 2001 we find that the whole world is becoming unified against who against radical Islam Islam has been used to unite the whole world against the common enemy and once Islam has been dealt with, this whole world united are going to come after who? They're going to come after those that go against the beast power. Albert Pike was a 33 degree mason. What did he have to say? In a letter to Kasimi, to Kasipi Mazzini, dated 15th of August 1871, stated that the First World War was to be fomented in order to destroy Tsarist Russia and to place that vast land under direct control of Illuminati agents. Russia was then to be used as a bogeyman to further the aims of the Illuminati worldwide. World War II was to be fomented through manipulation of the differences that existed between German nationalists and the political Zionists. This was to result in the expansion of Russian influence and the establishment of a state of Israel in Palestine. In both instances, Pike's plan for world wars has been precisely carried out. These plans existed 40 to 60 years before the wars took place. The Third World War was planned to result from the differences stirred up by Illuminati agents between the Zionists and the Arabs. The conflict was planned to spread worldwide. And what do we find, brethren, today in Palestine? The little small nation of Israel is in constant threat and conflict with Islamics around them. In his book, The Keys of This Blood, I've got a copy here, you can see. On page 282 to 292, it talks about, this book, Keys of This Blood, talks about a three-way power struggle. Between who? Between the United States, between Russia, and between the papacy. This book was written before 1989. And it says that there can only be one master ruler of the world. And in this book it outlines how it will be Pope John Paul. Pope John Paul is dead now, but the, the essence of the book was that the papacy will be the world dominating power. And what took place in 1989? the collapse of Russia, or communistic Russia. And so this power of Russia will never have world dominion 
and the two-way struggle is now between America and the papacy and what is taking place we realize that that the USA is already the armies and the power force for the Catholic Church in this book it talks about in the whole world that they they have they have something called command rooms and in these command rooms these command rooms they have special um, uh, observations of particular groups and they have special strategies for these groups and these are the five command rooms Islam command room 2 Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons Seventh-day Adventists and Baptistic and Evangelistic sects or evangelical sects command room number 3 the Orthodox groups specifically the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodoxes Number four, they have animism, Hindus and the Buddhists. And the last one, they have Chinese, Japanese and Jews. Already recently, the Jews have suggested that they are open to keeping Sunday as a special day of rest as well. And also allowing certain commercial activities to take place on the Sabbath day. Before, this could never ever be dreamed of. And we know that prophetically, one by one, these groups, the whole world, will bow down to the knee of the papacy. Except one group, the Seventh-day Adventists. So at the moment, the, the church, the Catholic Church, is preoccupied mostly with Islam. And then it will go for the other groups. And one by one, they will fall. And who will be left to stand? The Seventh-day Adventists. Just like Islam protected the Protestants, allowed the Protestant Reformation to form and grow and take strength, and now God is using Islam today to give us time to study, to prepare, to perfect our characters, and to get ready for the final battle. The world will be united, it's happening now. Through radical Islam, the world will unite, and national apostasy and Sunday laws will be the result. A new world order is about to arrive. Brethren, let us use this time to study, to grow, to perfect our characters, because time is running out. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to use this time to ask for your mercy, your forgiveness. That, Lord, you will forgive us for our sins, forgive me for my sins. Father, we don't have a moment to lose. Lord, how we waste so much time precious valuable time father we need to be ready we need to Lord to make preparation in our hearts our minds our character father I pray that you will help us to cooperate with you in this area that Lord will be your faithful soldiers that father will be part of this great army in these last days is our prayer in the name of Jesus amen